Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Introduction to Construction. Today we're going to be looking at regulatory compliance. In particular, we're going to be looking at site safety, construction safety, and the Employment Standards Act and Human Rights Commission with regards to regulatory requirements for construction companies. So the Construction Safety Regulations or the Occupational Health and Safety Act for construction uh, projects is the governing act that we follow. We have the Occupational Health and Safety Act for construction uh, that is more specific to construction projects. And it has a lot of requirements with regards to protecting workers on construction sites. And so there are a lot of compliance uh, requirements that a construction company that has to follow and that managers who are managing employees have to follow and that employees have to follow. Um, everybody has to do what they call their due diligence, which means that you've made every effort to uh, ensure that the project is safe for yourself and safe for others uh, that may be entering or working on that construction site. So there's uh, a mutual accountability that must take place. So how do we improve uh, health and safety on construction sites? Well, we can do it proactively. Uh, so these are the things that you're trying to do to ensure that things don't happen. Uh, and that's the best avenue. If you can do everything possible to prevent something from happening, then that's great because it means you didn't have an accident, somebody didn't get hurt, uh, they can go home to their families, they can continue to earn a good living, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so there are proactive measures that companies are required to make. Uh, health and safety policies have a health and safety program. They're supposed to ensure that their employees are properly trained and oriented and communicated with, with some of the dangers that are going on in the project or potential dangers. dangers. There's job safety talks uh, um, that have to go on, sometimes called tail, tailgate meetings or toolbox talks uh, with regards to um, safety to make sure it's top of mind uh, in it for everybody working on site. It's not something that's supposed to be a book stuffed in a drawer that has the regulations and act. It's supposed to be something that is thought about, discussed, reviewed. Um, conditions that uh, are seen ahead of time uh, are uh, proactively addressed. Reactive measures is accident reporting and recording of accidents and the requirements regarding that. Uh, depending what the accidents are, they, uh, there's investigations that are done to determine what was the cause. And one of the reasons you do want to do investigations is to determine the cause so that then that can be part of the proactive measures to prevent and ensure that it does not happen again. As George Santayana once said, if we don't learn from the past, then we're doomed to repeat it. And so definitely in the area of safety, we want to make sure that these things are not repeated. So definitely that's a big part of it. So who's governed by the um, uh, Occupational Health and Safety Act? As the list says, pretty much every worker in our supervisor, employer, workplace in Ontario is governed by the act. Um, it doesn't apply to an owner, uh, occupant or servant. So like if it's your house and you're working on the weekend and you're, you're doing something and you're not doing it um, to the act and regulations and you hurt yourself, kind of on your own with it. But if you if you are an employee or working on a project or been hired to do something, then that follows falls under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, under some federal jurisdiction, just like we said with the National Building Code, there can be certain requirements where it will fall under um, national or federal jurisdiction. So they, they may come under in some cases, but again, they would be coming then encompassing that particular area with their safety regulations. But generally when we're talking about uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Act for construction projects, it's coming under OHSA. Uh, so what are employees responsibilities? As I said, everybody is responsible for safety and construction and um, the use of personal protective equipment, clothing as directed by the employer and directed by the Occupational Health and Safety Act. 
re responsibility to report workplace hazards. So if you see some, it's that old saying, if you see something, say something. Well, you, you're responsible for saying something. Everybody is responsible on construction uh, projects. Um, and you're responsible to work in a manner that's required by the employer and the prescribed safety equipment, to use it properly, to have been trained properly, to inspect it daily, to make sure that it's still functional and safe. Uh, and hopefully you've been trained so you can identify what is safe and what is not safe. Uh, so um, there is those uh, requirements from employees. And so what are your rights? Well, big one right to refuse unsafe work. So when if an employer is telling you, you get up there at that ladder, well, where's the fall arrest system? You just get up that ladder. You have a right to refuse work. You, are, you, know, you see it's not complying with the Occupational Health and Safety Act, you have a right to refuse. There's gray areas, just like I mentioned with the building code in 6A and railings, you know, what's climbable, what's not. There's gray areas. So you have a right to refuse work. Your employer can then get somebody else if they feel that it complies or the other person also feels that it complies. Or what they should do, the Ministry of Labor can make a decision on whether this is safe or this is not safe. You know, if you're a roofer and you're afraid of heights, maybe that's the wrong job for you, right? You still have a right to refuse work, but you're not going to... There's certain things that, that may not be in concert with the type of work that you're doing. On the other hand, if you're a roofer and it, the site and access to the roof and the fall arrest systems is not deemed to be safe, you have a right to refuse work and you have a right to have it inspected and um, deemed whether it's safe or not. That means that your employer can't fire you as a result of that. Does it ever happen that an employer fires you? Probably, but not because of that, because they, they would definitely lose. Um, would there be something down the road that they might make up? Hopefully not. Uh, but you definitely have that um, ability to refuse unsafe work. And to be honest, if you're an employer and you are not making your site safe and you're making people work in unsafe conditions, if I'm an employee, you know what? I'm not going to want to work for you very long. I'm going to be looking elsewhere. Uh, so then you have a big turnover of people. Can you run a successful construction business when people don't want to work with you? I'm going to say no, uh, not in today's environment. So you want to retain and attract the best people. And to retain and attract the best people, you need to work safely. And this is the act is the minimum safe requirements. You want to be beyond the act. That's why there's other training safety training certifications and programs that actually even go beyond what the act is so um, that would be uh, the um, point of view that i would take as an employer and that's the point of view that i think you should take as an employee uh, right to participate in the workplace health and safety activities through joint health and safety committees and again the legislation has requirements dependent on the size of the project uh, to have joint health and safety committee um, uh, activities and meetings and requirements so that there's inputs from labor and inputs from management to ensure that the site is safe. Right to know or the right to be informed about. So if there's some sort of condition that maybe you're not aware of but your employer is, they need to communicate that to you. So you're very aware of what you're getting yourself into when you're doing something. Uh, what does the uh, OHSA place on employers? Um, comply with the regulations, of course. Take all responsible precautions. So that would be due diligence. Do their due diligence to protect their employees. Make every effort possible to protect their employees. Keywords, due diligence. Uh, ensure that the equipment, materials, and protective equipment are maintained in good condition. Uh, implement the Occupational Health and Safety Program and policy as required by the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Uh, provide information, instruction, supervision um, to protect health and safety. So, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, cooperate with the JHSC. Duties of supervisors. You have a responsibility. So you're starting to see you've got the employee responsibility, you've got supervisory responsibilities, you've got the employer responsibilities. Uh, complies with the act, ensures equipments, proactive devices are in place, advises the worker of any potential um, safety dangers, and takes every precaution reasonable um, for protection of workers. You know what? 
it's not an easy thing being a supervisor uh, in today's marketplace. In some places like low-rise residential, uh, a lot of the trades work by piecework. If you work by piecework, you have extrinsic rewards that are saying go faster. And when you go faster, uh, if we think about time, cost, quality, and remember we had scope and we had safety off to the side there when we talked in the earlier class, people are going faster, there may be more of a, a, an incidence of they're compromising their safety. So they got this carrot out in front of them saying go faster. You know, more square foot you do, the more money you make, uh, as an example, framing. Uh, so now you're a supervisor for a builder. These employ these Framers don't work directly for you, but you are the manager of that site. So trying to ensure that they comply sometimes can be challenging. And so you have to enforce the Occupational Health and Safety Act. If you see that they're doing something that is not complying, that is putting their own lives, they're doing it. You're not telling them to do it, yet they're doing it. You are responsible to make sure that they comply with the act. So if that means... Uh, saying to the framing subcontractor, this individual refuses to operate safely. I no longer want them on our site. That means you have to do those things because you ultimately are responsible for their safety. Uh, if they hurt themselves or become critically injured, uh, there will be an investigation. Uh, you could be held criminally responsible if you're just looking the other way and not acting, doing your due diligence. Same with your employers and the level of fines goes up. I don't know if they've recently changed it, but up to a couple of years ago, it was $25,000 for like a, a manager, site super, and it was half a million dollars for an employer. I suspect if they've changed it, it's gone up, not gone down. Um, that would be um, the trend of the way this goes. And a company that is uh, constantly not complying with the act or enforcing the act uh, can the owners can be actually held criminally responsible for that. So those are major changes that have taken place in the legislation over the last 10 years. And it really has had an impact on how employers view the work on safety on their sites, which I think is so much more to the better, betterment of the overall industry. Uh, as you may be aware, if you worked on smaller construction sites that often these things are kind of ignored, smaller renovation sector, that sort of thing. A lot of smaller renovators that aren't properly licensed, aren't properly trained, maybe contravening the act in a multitude of ways. And usually everything is hunky-dory until something happens. And then the full force of the legislation comes in. Don't be one of those people that gets into reactive mode because you weren't following the act and regulations. Make sure your people are trained and make sure that you're following the act and regulations. Um, there will be other courses that you will take that are specific on construction safety uh, and um, the act and make sure that you pay attention during those courses because it may, it's a big deal. It is a big deal. Plus, you don't want on your conscience that somebody got unnecessarily hurt on one of your projects because it's something that you didn't do. You want to make sure that you've done your due diligence so you can deal with confidence. Do accidents still happen? Yes, they still happen. Uh, even though you did your due diligence. You know, somebody just makes a, a simple error. Unfortunately, these things do happen. But you definitely want to minimize uh, the chances of those things happening. And it really is creating a culture in the companies that you work with of safety. And you can operate in a culture of safety very efficiently and very profitably. Nobody accounts into the lost morale, the lost engagement, the lost motivation by people working for companies that they feel don't really care about them at all, that they're just a number. If you feel that your manager cares, if you feel that your company cares, you'll have more engaged, motivated people working with you and you'll retain those people over a longer period of time and that will lead to success in this industry. So the health and safety program is required by law and uh, all of those requirements of, uh, uh, come into play um, with uh, the program and uh, the, uh, what the program looks like. So there can be variances in that, but at the end of the day, the program has to comply with the overall Occupational Health and Safety Act requirements. So that's that 
um, area. The Act also requires employers in Ontario to assess the risks of workplace violence and to put in place policies and programs regarding workplace violence and workplace harassment. This is no longer acceptable in the workplace. And I'll be honest, I think construction probably still has some lingering impacts. I think, you know, office workers, that came into being probably about 15 years ago where there was a lot more uh, evidence of these kind of issues in offices. And I think that's really been rooted out well. And I think this has become a big issue in the last uh, seven to eight years in construction sites where this isn't deemed to be acceptable behavior. And again, this goes back to everything I was just discussing. If you want to have engaged and motivated people, you can't have a, a place of disrespect or harassment going on. And so the days of the site super where they would bully somebody are gone. And if there's still remnants and you witness it, they're not going to be around for very long because things are becoming much more um, where we have become intolerant to this kind of behavior on construction projects. So if you still see some of it, you, hopefully this will be, you'll know that there's, there's legislation in place to protect workers uh, from this kind of harassment. So there are protections in place. And then the next thing I would say is, is this a company, do I, if that's the culture, this is probably not a company that I want to work with very long. And there are very good companies out there that respect this big companies and they're the best ones that I've seen at really sort of embracing this kind of behavior because they can see the damage it does uh, to the culture and they want to maintain the culture they want to improve the culture so violence harassment uh, workers uh, hurt maybe hurt threatened um, unacceptable fireable ex uh, fireable offenses um, uh, inappropriate unacceptable behaviors um, these are all um, fireable offenses, again, when the documentation comes in and they're reviewed um, for these particular purposes. And there's a lot of backup in the legislation to protect um, companies from that are trying to ensure their, play, their workplaces do not have these problems and issues. So, yeah, it kind of follows along uh, what I was saying here and um, how this... Uh, how this impacts also mental health issues and again WSIB claims and things of that nature they go up WSIB is worker safety and insurance board and that's really when something happens uh, and it occurs how this needs to be um, dealt with paid for and so there's dues that are collected premiums that are paid by employers to protect their employees if something happens and that's the workers safety insurance board and it's mandatory requirements to employers uh, in the construction sector that those premiums are paid and that that means that if they are injured in uh, the workplace or if there are areas of this um, that occur with, from workplace harassment mental health issues as a result of that then these are all things that also would impact uh, companies' uh, premiums that they pay because it's very much like car insurance from that point of view. A lot of claims, higher rates. A lot of accidents, higher rates. Uh, so that can pretty much make it that you can't, can't be competitive in the industry because you're paying so much higher rates than your competitors because they have low incidents and you have high incidents. So you need to treat these complaints very seriously and stop it. If you're working with a larger company, they'll have an HR department that you can consult with, that you can work with to make sure that you're complying with the act and regulations. If you're working with a smaller company, you'll have to look into it and find more of the requirements and what's being contravened and what you need to do as a manager in these cases. But you need to take them very, very seriously and don't just look the other way. Uh, so, and really uh, labor laws, uh, also, labor regulations, um, there's what we call industrial relations, and there's the Industrial Relations Act. We've talked about unions in a previous uh, class, um, but the Industrial Relations Act deals with labor, lo labor laws with unions, and of course, your contract, your collective agreement with unions comes into play um, for those particular cases. And if there's non-unions, there's, uh, in the case of uh, labor regulations, there's what we call the Employment Standard Act. And the ESA, as it's termed, will determine um, what pay rates, what overtime, 
what the limitations are, what the requirements are for employment of workers. Um, but the union collective agreement, if it's a unionized employee, um, they will be beyond whatever's in the Employment Standards Act, and then you have to make sure that you're complying with um, the collective agreements. And a closed shop means membership in the union is a precondition for employment. So that's that happens a lot in construction. You might be uh, Labor's International Union of North America. You might have to be registered as a member. And then when a company needs people, they will go to the, they'll say they're going to the hall, union hall. It's kind of a little term where people are waiting at the hall to get employment um, for the particular project. Um, that they're working on. So that's kind of the closed shop, union shop. Once hired, all employees must join the union. So that would be where, well, I hire somebody and now I have to make sure that they're registered with the union and they pay dues to the union. Um, it could be that way. So closed shop, union shop, open shop, that means you don't have to be a unionized employee to join. doesn't mean you couldn't still be a member of a union and join a non-unionized company, um, but that just means that you as an individual are continuing to pay your union dues. Employment standards uh, legislation, as I mentioned, it sets the, the tone for what are the minimum requirements with regards to holiday pay. So, for example, if you employ somebody, you have to withhold 4% of their, well, four, not withhold, but 4% of their pay is um, held for vacation pay. So if, you're, if, they're, if you paid them 30, let's say $50,000 in a year, then you also have to pay them 4% uh, of that for holiday pay. Uh, and or vacation pay, if you will. Uh, and of course, there are certain holidays that are mandatory holidays that you have to also pay for. Uh, and ones that you may not have to pay for, you may still pay them, but you don't necessarily have to. Um, so it's holidays that you do have to pay for typically are ones like uh, Labor Day, uh, Christmas, uh, Boxing Day, but ones that you may not have to pay for are like Family Day or the Civic Holiday, Simcoe Day, that's in August. Uh, most employers will, but by the Employment Standard Act, it says what you as an employer have to do and what you don't have to do. So all of those um, requirements come in. Uh, I mentioned human rights legislation, and there are human rights uh, tribunals, and there is the Human Rights Commi Commission in Ontario and the Human Rights Code uh, that has to be complied with by employers as well. I've left a um, link here uh, at the end. I've got a few links here, I think we'll probably check some of these out in our live class uh, and go through a little bit of uh, them as well, especially the videos. Uh, we have the Ontario Human Rights Code, the Employment Standards Act, uh, Infrastructure Health and Safety Association uh, link there. And there is the minute, so there's really, so there's Infrastructure Health and Safety Association. It used to be uh, Construction Safety Association of Ontario, but they've kind of merged it in with the mining sectors and other sectors. Uh, and they're really the preventative wing, trying to prevent being proactive uh, accidents from occurring with training uh, and um, information so that accidents can be prevented. Uh, we have the WSIB, Worker Safety Insurance Board, as I mentioned, that's to you know provide money and insurance for employees that are injured so that basically they can be uh, either retrained or they can get back on board with their company. Uh, that happens too, like some retraining maybe that somebody got injured at work and maybe they've got enough knowledge in a particular sector but they need more knowledge so maybe they, they come to college for a couple of years to take a program to retrain themselves in that area to provide opportunities there. Um, so that is uh, WSIB's role and the Ministry of Labor's role, MOL, their job is, and they've got a bunch of inspectors throughout the province that have been unhired, hired, is to come and inspect construction sites. Are they complying with the Occupational Health and Safety Act? And they can give out fines uh, to people that are not. So as I mentioned earlier, somebody's working unsafely, the, that employee can be fined, the, the site super can be fined, and the employer can be fined. So if an employee's fined $250, you know, you could have the site super that's fined 5,000 and you could have the employer that's fined a much larger amount. So it tends to go up. The severity of the fines tends to go up once there's been an accident or if it's a repeat offense. Uh, but that's the enforcement arm of um, the 
legislation, Ministry of Labor. You have to have somebody that enforces it. We talked about building codes in 6A, and the enforcement was done by the municipality. And uh, the enforcement of the Safety Act is um, the Occupational Health and Safety Act for construction projects is the Ministry of Labor. And they usually wear a blue hard hat. And so when you see a blue hard hat come to a construction site, uh, that usually gets a pretty quick response. It's funny, I, I, they switched. At one point, they, they didn't have the blue, and I had a blue hard hat, and I'd started going to visit construction sites, and everybody was kind of like nervous whenever I was walking by, and it's because they thought I was Ministry of Labor. Um, so there's definitely that connotation that, that um, goes there. But their job is to enforce um, the act and regulations. So... If you get a chance, you can watch some of these on your own or check out some of these particular sites. Uh, I'm going to load the, the files in the lecture side, so, or I'll put them in the, the notes uh, underneath. That's probably the best thing in, on YouTube, so you have them on and you can always uh, click on them there to reference. So that's what I wanted to cover in this section of 6B. Um, this is uh, Tom Stevenson signing off and hoping everybody has a wonderful day. Bye for now.